Hello, my name is Rachel Deaton and I'm with the Autism Society of Indiana and I'm doing the Autism Spectrum Disorder Autism 101 presentation today. Um, my biggest qualification for doing this presentation is I am a mother of a son with autism. He just recently turned 18. I live this life, I work in this life, um, I've been doing this for a very long time. So I have a lot of personal experience with autism. And so that um, is how I relate and how I live my life every day is to help people affected by autism and help their families and help them think outside the box and ways that can make their life better. Um, so what are some of the basic numbers and statistics with autism? One in 54 people are diagnosed with autism in the United States. These are the 2020 numbers. So obviously um, it might be a little different now, but the CDC has not released new numbers on autism recently. Um, boys are five times more likely than girls to be affected by autism. There are 128 million people on the autism spectrum worldwide. And autism is the fastest developmental disability with a 10 to 17% annual growth. Um, they're actually thinking that all these statistics are higher as um, the statistics have been put on hold during the pandemic. And so they're thinking these numbers will be even more drastic when they are released next time. So people really wanna know what is autism? How do you define autism? Autism is characterized by three different things. One is deficits in communication. Two is deficits in social skills. And three is unusual behaviors. Um, so a lot of people wanna know like, how come there's not autism, PD, NOS, or Asperger's anymore? And that was because of a direct change in diagnosis in the DSM-5. Um, the DSM-5 umbrellaed all of those diagnoses into an autism spectrum disorder. Um, that was really because a lot of individuals on the spectrum who were having autism or PDD, NOS, or Asperger's, they were not getting the same treatments even though they needed to get them. And insurance would um, really limit the, the help you could get by what diagnosis you had. Um, and so they umbrellaed into autism spectrum disorder. Well, now some professionals um, are diagnosing with levels, levels one, two, and three. Um, and if you're diagnosed with the levels, you can also be limited on what you're diagnosing with. Um, I don't think that the diagnosing criteria has been completely worked out on how they're going to do that or what they're going to do. Um, insurance companies want the levels so they can um, limit the amount of um, services that are provided or how much um, are provided. So they're still controversial and they're working through that process right now. So what is autism? Um, it is a neurological disorder. It is not a mental health disorder like depression or um, bipolar disorder or um, um, schizophrenia. It is a neurological disorder. Autism spans the entire lifetime of an individual, and there is no known cause or cure for autism. If you've been diagnosed with autism, you have autism. So really, when we say autism is a spectrum disorder, we really need to talk about what does that mean? Um, because if you've met one individual with autism, you really only met one individual with autism. Um, so you could be gifted and have measured intelligence in the gifted area, or you could be have an intellectual disability. Um, your social interaction for an individual with autism could have a variety of friendships, or not interested in others. Communication could be very non-verbal or non-verbal. Um, behaviors could be intense to mild. Um, sensory, they could be very sensitive to say, sounds and um, pain or not. And that, that could go for different things. You could be all over the line with the sensory issues. And motor skills, um, gross motor skills, such as walking and fine motor skills could be really different. So for example, my son, is kind of borderline intelligence. He is very social. He wants to know what all of his friends are doing and he wants to know where they're at and what they're doing. He wants to be with other people. Um, communications wise though, my son is verbal, but he cannot have a back and forth communications with you. He cannot sit down and have a conversation where it's your turn, my turn to talk and go back and forth. He would only really wanna talk about what he's interested in 
And if you didn't want to talk about what he was interested in, he would pretty much move on. Um, his behaviors are sometimes intense and sometimes mild. He does not have behaviors such as stimming as hand flapping, but he has some severe meltdowns um, when he doesn't understand what's going on or changes in routine. He's not able to handle those types of behaviors very well. And so he might have meltdowns. Um, he has very little sensory needs but he has um, his pain tolerance. He does not feel pain. And so he could be hurt really badly. And he would not even tell me that he's hurt really badly. Um, and then his motor skills, he has really great gross motor skills. So when he was like three years old, he got on a bike with no training wheels and just rode. And he had never been on a bike before. Um, and so he just knew how to ride a bike. But then his handwriting took him like five or six years to be able to grasp a pencil and, and be able to write appropriately. So when we talk about communication difficulties in autism, these are some of the things that we are talking about. A delayed response time. Um, so for example, with my son Luke, you could ask him what's two plus two in the morning at math class, that's his first class. And then by the end of the day, um, he might answer four and he's probably in English class and the English class teacher will be like, what? And he is still processing and thinking about that first question. And oftentimes individuals on the spectrum get layers of questions and they're still working on the first one because um, other individuals are impatient and that causes some frustration. Um, difficulty organizing thoughts and assignments. So especially if you're a teacher, if you're a professional trying to help an individual on the spectrum, you have to, they need time to organize their thoughts. And they also need time to organize what's, what's given of them. A lot of pictures, a lot of written word if they understand writing and they can read. Um, the ability to help them organize their thoughts and mark off tasks are extremely helpful. Um, and not giving more than one or two steps at a time, depending on what that individual is able to do. Um, difficult with abstract or conceptual thinking. Um, you know, really that's the, the gray areas. What is the meaning of the story? What is the moral of the story? Um, if, you, if I say you're driving me crazy, he would really think he's driving me crazy and not understand. Um, uh, you know, those are things you have to be really careful around individuals on the spectrum to say or do because they don't understand what you're talking about. It's those those um, those things you say in everyday conversation that you don't know could be perceived in, in a different way. And that's the struggles for, for individuals on the spectrum. Uh, disruptive behaviors in high stress situations, in public situations, in situations like they go to gym class and it's really noisy and people are, that noise is echoing or if there's a clicking noise or if a light is vibrating or if, um, the, there's an echo, or if you're outside and the birds and bugs are really loud. My son had a really hard problem during the cicada season when there was just a constant humming of cicadas and we couldn't really do anything about that. We had to explain what cicadas were, why they were louder this year than normal, um, and work through that, but, you know, that, that created more stress for him. Um, difficulty with facial and nonverbal cues. And I think that we're all getting a taste of this right now, especially since we've been wearing masks a lot. Um, my son really doesn't understand when people are getting aggravated or annoyed that he's talked about trains for 30 minutes and they're ready to change the subject. He will not pick up on those facial nonverbal cues that you're ready to move on. Um, and so we try to work on one, him asking if, they're, if they wanna still talk about trains, but two, also having other people interact and tell them, telling Luke what he, what they want to do, if they want to talk about something else. Um, also, a lot of individuals on the spectrum do not have eye contact and they often look to the side. They will still be listening to you and, and processing, but sometimes the trying to process facial and um, nonverbal cues along with listening is overwhelming and so they're not able to um, tie all that together. So they really try to just listen and focus on the listening part and not the other cues so they can maybe process what you're asking or communicating with them. Um, receptive and expressive speech issues. So this would be the monotone speaking. This would be understanding inflection and tone. 
Um, this would be the back and forth in a conversation. This would be, it's my turn to speak and it's your turn to speak. Um, my son has cue cards that we really work on in speech therapy that says my turn and your turn and we move the arrow back and forth to try to see, teach some of those receptive and expressive speech. So really when we think about some challenges for individuals with autism. One is poor communication skills and difficulty in social situations. Um, and unfortunately, I think these are growing more and more with every generation. Um, but for individuals on the spectrum, they are not able to have that back and forth. And they're, they often lose friends and they often don't maintain acquaintances because of these difficulties. Um, and individuals on the spectrum really, really lack theory of mind. And this is a really key to understanding what um, individuals on the spectrum sometimes think. Theory of mind is the ability to recognize that others, people will have thoughts and feelings that are different from one's own. Um, so a perfect example of this is the Coke freestyle machine. You know, you have like hundreds of choices on the Coke freestyle machine. You can get any combination you want. My son really likes the grossest combinations ever, the lime, vanilla, you know, Dr. Pepper or Coke. And I really don't like pop at all. I'm more of a Gatorade, Powerade, non-carbonated tea type girl. And so every time we go to a restaurant and there's a Coke freestyle machine, my son thinks everybody wants to drink what he wants to drink and they want it when he wants it. And so he'll always try to fill everybody's cups up with what he's drinking. And it sometimes causes frustration for him because he thinks he's helping us, but he's really not. Um, and then also he thinks that everybody wants to watch the same shows that he likes. So he really likes Jeopardy and he thinks grandma and grandpa watch Jeopardy and, and all of his aunts and uncles and, and mom and dad all watch Jeopardy at the same time because he really likes Jeopardy. And let's say he comes in at 7.30 and we're not watching Jeopardy. He might get really frustrated without saying anything because he thinks we all should just know that he likes Jeopardy and would be watching Jeopardy at the same time. Um, and maybe a final example of that would be cookies. So Luke really likes chocolate chip cookies. I really like oatmeal raisin cookies. My husband really likes gingerbread, shortbread type, the crunchy crumbly cookies. So a thing with that to show theory of mind is that Luke might really want a chocolate chip cookie and he might be sitting there and getting aggravated and aggravated and getting more frustrated because he thinks that we all want chocolate chip cookies and he cannot understand why mom is not already up getting chocolate chip cookies because if he wants chocolate chip cookies then I must, you know, his mom must want chocolate chip cookies and his, his sister must want chocolate chip cookies and his dad must want chocolate chip cookies. So why do we not just get the chocolate chip cookies? Even though he's never said anything about that, we don't have the ability to know that. So that's really the struggle there is how do we get that um, information and how do we work through that and get him to understand that he needs to vocalize what he wants and that we all don't want and think everything um, at the same time. Um, individuals on the spectrum might have few friends and relationships and that's limited to just patience and time and caring, uh, you know, being able to work through the steps of autism and understanding that they might have perks that you have to work extra hard at to be a friend with. Um, again, difficulty with eye contact and nonverbal cues, it might be overwhelming with them and they might not be able to process that information and forcing them to maintain eye, eye contact is really a difficult thing because then they're focusing so much because they know they're going to get in trouble if they don't and then they lose what you're asking or communicating to them. And daily living tasks do not come naturally to individuals on the spectrum. They have to have prompts and reminders of how to do Day of living steps. So as a, for example, my daughter and my son are two years apart. Um, for my son to learn how to brush his teeth, it took like 20 steps and he had to have picture charts and he still has to have picture charts to remind him how to brush his teeth and what to do in each step. Whereas um, my daughter is two years younger, she has learned how to brush her teeth and she doesn't need the reminders every day. Um, and so that's where daily living tests do not come naturally. They have to be constantly reminded. Individuals on the spectrum need to be constantly prompted, um, usually how to get through these steps every day. Um, some individuals on the spectrum do not, but a large majority of them have living tasks. Daily living tasks have to be 
um, scheduled um, and picture charted or written out for them to, to remember all the stuff. So then we think about what are some behavioral challenges with individuals on the spectrum? What behaviors might you see and how can you navigate those behaviors? One is insistence on sameness and difficulty transitioning. Um, so my son has a really hard time with transitions, especially from home, which is his preferred environment to a non-preferred environment like school or therapy. Um, and he wants the, the, the routine to be the same every time we do it. Um, and so let's say he wants to go get a Coke in the morning for McDonald's and a hash brown, and they're out of hash browns or the Coke that he wants, that could really throw off his morning. Or if we're at home and something difficult happened, we might have um, some challenges with that. So really insistent on the sameness. If there is a, a, a pep rally coming up and they might not be in class or there's gonna be a fire drill or you're gonna go to a wedding or you're gonna go do something different that you haven't done on a regular date, you would want to preview that with an individual on the spectrum and let them know that you're not going to be able to do that. Let's say you're a best buddy and you have a standing lunch with an individual on Thursdays and you're not gonna make it the next Thursday, you want to prep them with that and you wanna remind them of that and tell them why and send them constant texts or emails or reminders so they will be able to know that that's gonna happen to keep the, the behaviors down. Um, stemming and repetitive moments or speech. My son um, has really some phrases he says when he starts to get keyed up, Thomas phrases, um, things I have said when I'm emotional that he's picked up probably inappropriately. Um, it could be spinning, it could be flapping. Those are coping mechanisms. They're not really needed to stop unless they're in appropriate situation and maybe try to give them something less distracting in that situation. But, um, you know, that's how they cope with, with what's going on and the expectations that are put on them. Sensory issues. This again could be sound, it could be taste, it could be um, textures. A lot of um, food aversions are because of sensory issues. Um, some individuals on the spectrum only eat liquidy type things and some only eat crunchy things. It's because the sensory issues are too much. Sometimes it could be the sounds of crunching things really bothers them. Um, my son has some sound aversions to loudness. So if we go to like um, a hockey game or a football game, we have to be considerate of the noise and how loud that will be in the arena. Um, if we go to, um, you know, church, is it going to be really loud? Do we need to sit in a balcony because the, the old music is louder down at the bottom? Um, those are the types of things that you need to be considerate of, sensory issues, um, lights, lots of people around them. Um, are you in their safety bubble? And are they minding your safety bubble? Those are things that you could talk about. Um, perceived aloofness or prepare, prefers to be alone. My son, um, for example, really likes to be with people, but he might not like interacting with you sometimes. So he feels like your friend just sitting next to you at the lunch table or sitting with you at the library. Um, and that's enough for him. And so he wants to be with you, but he it might perceive that he's not wanting to be that one. Um, and really the only way to learn that is to discuss it or talk with them or talk with the people who work with them about um, if they wanna be social or not, because maybe they don't wanna be around anybody. Both of those are options. Um, visual learners, again, the picture charts, the, the do you want to go to this restaurant or that one and maybe showing them pictures online, giving them visual references to questions that you're asking. Um, and perseveration on a particular topic. This is a really big one. Um, trains, elevators, signs, it could be really anything. Weather, um, electric um, poles and conductors or electricities. Um, it could be for, for, it could be all over the spectrum. And those are only the ones that my son's been interested in. So they really get stuck on a topic and they wanna learn everything about that topic and they want to tell everybody everything they know. And they really think that you are interested in that. So they do not know when to stop talking about that. And so they really want to keep communicating to you about that information because that's what they know the best and that's what they're most interested in. And they feel like you are too. They don't really understand that you like and um, want different things than they do. Again, that lacking theory of mind. 
So then we talk about what are some health issues that go along with autism. Um, intellectual parent impairment appears in 70% of the cases. Um, seizures and epilepsy appears in 40% of cases. Um, my son had epilepsy and it has epilepsy. It started when he was 12. And we were driving down the road and he had a seizure. Um, there's some hot spots that come along with that. Um, that would be early childhood, that puberty change, and then that young adulthood, that 18 to 20 years, 22 years old, depending on age, when their brain chemistry changes, there's hot spots for having seizures and epilepsy showing up. Um, sleeping and eating issues. Um, I will tell you individuals on the spectrum usually do not sleep well. Um, they don't have a good sleep pattern. And then that can also be frustrating during the day where they are not able to function well because they haven't slept well. Um, ear and respiratory complications, allergies and into intolerances, especially to some foods, um, and dual diagnosis with mental health illness, especially when they leave the school sector to the adulthood sector. There's just really not a lot of programming to help individuals who are adults on the spectrum. And so they go home and they sit and, um, you know, almost 85% of individuals with autism don't ever have a job or do anything after high school. And so they just go home and sit and then they get depressed. And so other mental health diagnoses come along with that. Um, what are some strategies with individuals with autism? This is really key. Um, I know somebody was talking about this before we started the presentation. One is having clear and concise rules and expectations. Um, make sure you know what you're doing, what the tasks are, where you're meeting, where you're going, um, how long it will last. Make sure that every encounter is very, you know, planned out and expectations of those are really communicated well via and in multiple ways. Um, hope with that. Um, another thing is breaking down tasks into smaller steps. So having each um, presentation broken down into smaller steps. Um, you know, we're going to do A, B, and C, then we'll take a break, and then we're going to do D, E, and F and take a break. Um, and so breaking down each part of the task into small steps. Um, prepare for changes in routines. Again, talking about, hey, we're not going to be able to do this because this is closed. Or in Bloomington, let's say, we can't go to your favorite restaurant today because there's too much traffic in a football game. Um, so we're going to have to do this instead, you know, prepare, preparing them that for a week in advance, telling them every day, reminding them that, okay, we're going to do something, but it's not going to be what we typically do. We're changing the plan. Um, avoid verbal overload of instructions. So that would be really what I'm doing now, talking to you about things and then telling you all the details and other anecdotal things that go along with that. Individuals on the spectrum can't find the important information in that. So avoid doing that. Just hit the bullet points, right? Don't give all the gray area, the extra stuff. Just hit the bullet points. Um, be consistent with treatment. Individuals on the spectrum shouldn't be treated differently than individuals not on the spectrum. Um, expect you know, the same from them and try to realize that they need accommodations, but don't treat them differently. Um, Use multiple means of communication, again, via talking on the phone in person and then reminding with text and emails and you know maybe writing it down for them on a piece of paper. So that way they can be whatever's best for them. They will, will remember one of those options usually. So really we've had a lot of challenges for individuals on the spectrum during this pandemic? And what are some strategies of helping individuals during a pandemic? One is really consulting their therapists, teachers for strategies at home. So what, what are we talking about with that? Oh, sorry about that guys. Let me go back. I went a little too far. There we go, um, at home. So, and also talking to their guardians or the caregivers, if you're just trying to be a friend, our, um, so that would be doing the same things through each aspect of life. So having a plan for home that matches the plan for school, that matches the plan for therapy, and being able to carry the strategies and the plans from one place to another. So let's say we get stuck at home again for a while and you don't have the plan that the school did, but you're still working on the strategies the same way that school did. And being able to have that 
same strategy carried through the day, you'll be prepared to keep up that, that routine and that sameness for your child. They won't be thinking what's going on at our house. Um, again, replicate visual schedules and charts at home. So like if they follow a schedule or a visual chart at school, ask the teacher what it looks like so you can make one similar for your home life. Um, again, be flexible because as much as you think that the routine is made, uh, you can't change a routine, but the individual on the spectrum can and will change the routine at any time. Um, I have a hard time with that because I make a routine and then they, <laughs> my son is like, no, I want to do this. And I'm like, wait, what? Because we scheduled this and I have to be flexible because he's changed what he wants to do that day. Um, create a routine that is similar to their daily schedule. So if they have a schedule that they usually run to, but their normal routine is going to be different, how can you make that similar to a home situation or outside of the home? You know, have lunch and breakfast at the same times, have um, breaks at the same times, try to build on those things that you know, what if they do minds in motion at school, try to do something similar at home at the same time, trying to keep them as similar as possible without bringing them. Um, practice mask wearing in small increments. And this could be like even working from just holding the mask to touching the mask, to feeling the mask, to maybe just touching your face with the mask, to putting the mask on your ears for a second, to slowly building up time. So that process of wearing a mask could be very difficult. Um, realize that it's really okay not to be okay. Um, and for me, the biggest one that I've realized it's okay not to be okay is that we are always late to school because that's the hardest transition for my son. So I have just not accepted that we are not going to be there on time. We are going to be 10 to 15 minutes late at least every day. And I've told the school that that's what we're going to do. And I can't make it better. And so we're just, I got to be okay that we're going to be late. It's really hard for me because I'm a I want to be on time, but um, my son's need to be able to work through that anxiety is bigger than my need to be on time. Um, and really be okay to ask. It's just great to ask for help. I want people to ask me how to interact with Luke so they the relationships can build longer than what they are already. I want him to build friendships and I want him to build um, relationships that lasts a long time. And so with that, I want him to be able to have that relationship. And if you want to ask me for guidance on how to have relationships with my son, I would love to help it because I want it to be a lifelong friendship and not a fleeting, a fleeting interaction. So then we talk about what are some challenges for professionals dealing with individuals on the spectrum. Um, one is, understanding the unique needs of each person you deal with, with the, on the spectrum. So again, we go back to that. If you've met one person on the spectrum, you've met one person on the spectrum. Well, as a professional, if you're a teacher, a social worker, anybody dealing with somebody with autism, you might think you got it figured out and you can help them because you knew Joe with autism. And then you meet Sam with autism and he's a completely different person and a different need, a different like, a different sensory needs, um, different way different than Joe or John, I can't remember what I said. And so you really have to think outside the box and approach each individual on the spectrum as being different and knowing that it's different from person to person. And that you can't just think that what works with the first individual respect on the spectrum will work with the second or third or fourth. And you might learn something from each individual and be able to piece together um, from your experiences how to help individuals on the spectrum. Um, again, making adaptations for individuals with autism. Um, this is really helpful with realizing that if you have a friend on the spectrum and you want to meet them for lunch, you might want to say, I want to meet you for lunch. And then can we set an alarm on your phone? Can, how can I help you to make sure that you remember and that you get there on time? Do you need a ride? Things like that. Um, and a classroom it could be do you need to take breaks? Do you need sensory issue, um, sensory toys to play with? Do you need um, to do one or two tasks and then have a stop time and talk about trains and then do one or two more tasks and talk about trains? Do you need that back and forth? I'm really working on how can we help the individual be the best that they can be and us helping them adapt to our environment while we adapt to them. Um, teaching acceptance. 
to those working with the individual. Um, again, let's say my son has been out. I try really hard to take him out into public situations and get him acclimated into society, but I also see it as um, helping those individuals working with my son, being able to um, being able to have that back and forth with them, being able to um, teach about autism and using my son as the ability to, for individuals to learn about autism. So it's a give and take. My son has to learn about society, but society also has to learn about my son. Um, really preparing for unforeseen challenges. It's like having that, that, that bag that preschool or, or little kids, babies, moms have, that diaper bag, having those tools that you need with you um, to help, you know, what's going to happen if he has a meltdown? How are we going to clear the area? How are we going to help him work through that information? How are we going to um, be strategic in what we do and and be prepared if things go awry? What are we going to do if there's really loud um, noises or we go somewhere and it doesn't work? How can we have an exit strategy? Sitting on the end of the row, how can we work through um, do we have their favorite treats? Do we have um, their favorite things to talk about? Do we have, um, have we talked to their guardian or caregiver if they have one and saying, what makes you calm and how can we have that on ready? Um, and really appreciating the differences that autism brings. Um, my son has taught me more about loving people unconditionally and being there for them than anybody I have ever met. Um, he loves everyone he meets. He thinks the best of them and he wants to be there for them and he wants to give them things. Um, and he will talk to anybody in the grocery store and make them feel special. And I sometimes am scared that he's going over the lines. Um, but, you know, if he stops somebody in the grocery store and says, I like goldfish because they have goldfish in their carts, well, that's an appropriate thing to do. Um, and they might make that person feel special and they might be having a bad day. So, you know, appreciating the differences that autism brings. And understanding that autism is different. It's not less or more than a, a typical individual. It's just different. And accepting differences in people is key, um, not just with autism, but all walks of life via race, race ethnicity, um, sexuality, um, disability, all those, and, you know, appreciating the differences and understanding that it's not less or more. So how can the Autism Society help with this situations? Um, one, we do these presentations, they're free of charge. Um, two, I do a Medicaid waiver presentation and Chris is able to put off that date too because we will be doing that in two weeks. Um, and we will be doing an adult on the spectrum one too. Um, we are a referral service for assistance with diagnosis, insurance, and school issues. Um, my coworker, Brittany Crane, is on this call also. She will put her email address in the chats um, if you want to reach out for her for some assistance. Um, we're a provider of respite and personal assistance care through the Family Supports Waiver. Um, we have clients that we help um, that are on the spectrum, and we hire individuals to work with those individuals. Um, to be direct care providers. Um, we provide career services through vocational rehab services. 